Welcome to lecture 5 of the course Experimental Vibration Analysis. In this lecture, we discuss two things. We start with some theory of spectrum analysis, and then continue with the main tool that we use for spectrum analysis in practice, the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT. This is a very important uh, signal analysis tool, and we will go through the DFT in some detail. The content of this lecture is found in chapters 8 and 9 of the book Noise and Vibration Analysis. This lecture is divided into two videos. In the first video, the present video, we talk about theory for spectrum analysis. And in the second video, we will discuss all there is to know about the Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform, the DFT. Before going on, I just want to remind you why we use spectrum analysis so much in vibration analysis applications. The main reason is, of course, that, as we also talked about before, that a linear system has a response, an output, which is a very clear, is very clear cut in the frequency domain. In the time domain, we know that the output is the convolution of the input and the impulse response. But in the frequency domain, it's much easier. The output spectrum is the input spectrum times the frequency response. The most important implication of this equation is that the response at a particular frequency, f, is a result only of the input and the FRF at that very frequency. So, thus, if we have a vibration problem, let's say a too high vibration level, for example, it's seven her 17 hertz. Then that is the result of a force at 17 hertz and the FRF amplification, so to speak, also at 17 hertz. But there are no other frequencies involved. So by measuring a spectrum of the output, then we found, find out at what frequency we have the problem. And then the vibration problem is often solved just by finding the explanation to why this frequency at 17 Hertz occurs. So that's why spectrum analysis is the key to understanding and solving vibration problems. So I hope you are well motivated to continue. As we discussed early in the first lecture of this course, there are three different signal classes that are treated separately in theory. It is the periodic signals, the random signals, and the transient signals. And particularly, these three different signal classes have different types of spectra that we will define in this video. So first, we start with the periodic signals. Periodic signals, as you know, are described by the Fourier series. The Fourier series theory says that, as we see here, if a signal is periodic, it can be decomposed into a number of signs of different frequencies. But not only that, we also know exactly which frequencies these signs have by knowing the period of the signal. So the lowest frequency has a frequency of 1 over the period of the composed signal. And then we have frequencies of two times that, three times that, etc. Furthermore, each sign component has an individual amplitude, frequency, and phase angle. So mathematically, we can write it like this. The periodic signal, x of t, can be written as a sum of a coefficients times cosines and b coefficients times sines and the frequencies 2 pi k over t sub p times t uh, these frequencies are simply the 1 over the period 2 over the period and so on we can also compute the a and b coefficients by knowing one period of the signal x of t now we can also use another form of the Fourier series, the complex 
Fourier series. We then have that the periodic signal x of t is written as a sum from minus infinity to infinity. The previous sum, as you saw here, was from 1 to infinity, because we only had positive frequencies. Now we change, for the complex Fourier series, we change the sum to go from minus infinity to plus infinity of some complex coefficients c sub k uh, times e to j 2 pi k over t sub p times t. The c coefficients are of course related to the a and b coefficients in the regular Fourier series. And they can also be computed from one period of the signal x of t. An important thing you must understand here is that this is a complex construction because we have the exponential e to j and so on. But because the signal x of t is real valued, the imaginary parts of the right on the right hand side of the equation here, the imaginary part parts here must be zero since we have a real value signal on the left. This means that all the imaginary parts are such that if you have a coefficient for a positive frequency, you have the corresponding negative coefficient for negative frequencies. So this is indicated here where c sub minus k equals c sub k complex conjugate. So the real values are the same but the imaginary part have opposite sign. This is actually very similar to the discrete Fourier transform that we will come to in the next video. Now, how shall we define a spectrum suitable for periodic signals? Well, in principle, a table of the a and b coefficients or the c coefficients, if you like, uh, would be sufficient but it wouldn't be very practical. The common spectrum we use for periodic signals then is called the linear spectrum or RMS spectrum. This spectrum typically has an interpretation such that a peak is interpreted as the RMS level of a sign at that frequency. It does not have a phase since phase requires a reference and we are talking about spectra so far of only one signal. Sometimes we also use a spectrum called the auto power spectrum, which is simply the square of the linear spectrum. Here is an example of a linear spectrum. It's from the vibrations measured on a fan, producing harmonics due to the rotation of the fan. So this spectrum reveals that there are a few dominant frequency components, such as this at approximately 30 hertz, and this at 100 hertz, and a few smaller components. As you see, the y-axis is, is scale in linear spectrum acceleration in meters per second square RMS. This is important, the RMS is important. And we will talk more about it in lecture six on spectrum estimation. The important thing is that a peak corresponds to the RMS level of a sine component and not to the amplitude. As we have discussed earlier, RMS levels are preferable over amplitudes. There are, however, some people who do use amplitudes instead for the scaling of linear spectra. This is usually called peak scaling. So thus, it's very important to specify clearly in your plot what type of scaling you have used. Otherwise, people will not be able to interpret if the levels are RMS or peak levels. If you're new to frequency analysis, this picture may, may help you to see the concept of time and frequency domains. The picture shows how the periodic signal is decomposed into its different frequency components as described either in the time domain or in the frequency domain. In the bottom plot, you see that the time signal is the sum at each time instant t of all the frequency components. So a value in time is the sum 
at that time across all frequency. In the frequency spectrum on the right hand side, you see each frequency component separately. It's important to realize that you see different things in the different domains, but it's the same signal, that is the same information, if you want, that you're looking at. In the time domain, for example, you can see the maximum and minimum value of the signal. But it's very hard to see what frequencies are in the signal. In the frequency domain, on the other hand, it's very easy to see which frequencies and even how high they are, but it's difficult to see the min and max of the signal. So that was spectra for periodic signals. We now turn to the random signals. To find out the nature of these spectra, we will do an abstraction. Let's assume that the random signal is actually a periodic signal, but that the period is very long. Actually, it goes towards infinity. That me means that we never encounter the second period of the signal. We know that the distance between two frequencies is a delta frequency of 1 over the period of the signal. When the period increases, the frequency components come closer and closer together. And in the limit, when the period becomes infinite, the spectrum becomes continuous. Now, there is one more thing to consider. The units must change. First of all, then, you should note that we have used the order power spectra measured in G squared. This is because we want RMS levels to be consistent consistent since the total RMS level of the periodic signal is the sum of the RMS levels squared. So we have the value squared so that we can sum them up. When the function becomes continuous, that is the number of frequencies becomes infinite, then we must normalize the function by its x-axis unit, in this case frequency. So for periodic signals we can have units of g squared or even g but for a random signal, we have to have squared units per hertz. This is called a density function and has the units of whatever we measured squared per hertz. Because it's the power of the signal, here the acceleration level squared, we call the spectrum a power spectral density or simply PSD. The RMS level of the entire signal can thus be interpreted as the square root of the area under the PSD, whereas for a periodic signal it comes from the sum of the squared values. But the PSD has a, an area under it which is proportional to the RMS squared, or the mean square value. The spectral density of a signal, x of t, is actually related to the autocorrelation, r sub xx. The PSD is simply the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. The Fourier transform results in a double-sided spectrum, which we denote s sub xx, which then contains negative frequencies as well as positive. The, uh, similarly, for two signals, we can define the cross-spectral density, CSD, also double-sided, as the Fourier transform of, of the cross-correlation. In practice, we never use these double-sided spectra, however. We produce single-sided spectra simply by moving over the negative frequencies on the positive side. And this is done simply because of the symmetry, simply by multiplying the positive frequencies by two, uh, except of course, of course for the DC frequency of zero, because this value only occurs once. Finally, we have the transient signals, or for a transient signal, we have two different spectrum spectra to use. Either we can use the transient spectrum. This is simply the continuous Fourier transform of the signal. 
This is obviously then a double-sided spectrum. And it has the nice property that if the signal x of t is a force, then the value at zero uh, equals the impulse of the force, as we will see. The transient spectrum is not very common in commercial measurement systems for noise and vibration analysis. Instead, usually a single-sided and squared variant is available, which is called energy spectral density, or simply ESD. This can easily be computed from the trans transient spectrum, as indicated here. Finally, we shall summarize the main points made in this video. For periodic signals, we use linear spectrum. For random signals, we should use the PSD, the power spectral density. Finally, for transients, uh, we have two different spectra, either the transient spectra, spectrum or, or the ESD, energy spectral density. In later lectures, we will see how these spectra are estimated in practice and why we are using these different spectra. You should now continue with video 5b.